We're going to end with our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Mr. George Pernsteiner. Uh, George is the Chancellor of the Oregon University System. In that role, he carries out the policies and directives of the Oregon State Board of Higher Education. Before his appointment in September 2005, Mr. Pernsteiner served as Executive Vice Chancellor, Chief Operations Officer, and Acting Chancellor of the Oregon University System from 2004 to 2005. Prior to joining the OUS, Mr. Pernsteiner was a senior administrator at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and served OUS for 13 years in campus and chancellor's office senior positions related to finance, planning, and administration. Please welcome Mr. George Pernsteiner. Well, thank you, Bob. It is really a privilege to be here with you tonight at the inaugural Dinner of Hope. First, I want to extend my thanks and congratulations also to Mayor Potter and Russ Danielson for their commitment to and leadership of this community. The theme that, that Promise gave me for tonight is civil rights in the 21st century. That is about as daunting a topic as I can imagine. It's daunting because it is complex, but it's also daunting because civil rights is a code term. It's a code term for something else. It is a code term for the divisions that have riven our society by race, by culture, by country of origin, by gender, by age, by sexual orientation, by income. Instead of a term that unites, it has become a term that divides. But if you look at its root, it is not that at all. Civil rights comes from the word in Latin for citizen. Because at bottom, civil rights are the rights of citizens. They are enshrined in our Constitution, and we know them by rote. Every one of you can recite the rights to worship, to assembly, to bearing arms, to speech. And the right to free speech has come over time to include the right to vote. And like all rights, this civil right did not come easily to most Americans. It took intense struggles over a long period of time for African Americans, for women, for American Indians, and for others among us to be accorded the basic right of citizenship, the right to choose our leaders, and in states like Oregon, to enact our own laws directly. This is the right most celebrated by the Oregon League of Minority Voters as you engage communities to help ensure that their voices are heard and are heeded at the local, at the state, at the national level. Your work is important, and I thank you for the courage and the commitment that you bring to it. So thank you for that, all of you. But we have a long way to go before this basic civil right is shared and exercised effectively by many in our communities. In Oregon, we have long prided ourselves on our voting record. We vote more fervently, more frequently, more directly than do people in most of the rest of the country. And we are proud of that fact. And indeed, that usually has been true. But that overall truth masks a very stark disparity, a disparity about who actually votes in this, the mecca of democracy. We talk frequently about the divisions that say that people of color do not vote at the same rate as do white people. Fundamentally, that isn't the only difference. 
If you look at the statistics nationwide from 2006 and in Oregon from 2006, there is something else, one other factor that actually will predict much more persuasively and much more accurately if someone is going to vote. That's the level of education of the voter. In 2006, only 40% of Oregonians without a high school diploma voted. For persons of color, that was only 25%. If you graduated from high school, you'll notch it up to 55%. And yet, if you were to look at who actually votes, the largest proportions, be they of whites or of persons of color, the voters disproportionately were those who had community college or college educations. Those who do not vote do not have education. So fundamentally, a voting right and its exercise is tied to an education right. And do we in this country, in this state, have a right to an education? The United States, beginning in the late 1800s, embarked on a very ambitious program of universal education. First with the three R's in elementary school, then with universal free high school, and after World War II, with the GI Bill, with a massive infusion into the adult population of college-educated veterans. We became the first country in the world where college was not the exclusive province of the wealthy, not the exclusive province of the corporate executives, and not the exclusive province of the government elite. Instead, we spread the benefits of college education to the managers and workers in our private, public, and volunteer sectors, and they brought with them the ambition, the flexibility of mind, the creative thinking that they had honed during their college experience. And the United States prospered, building the strongest economy in the world. Other countries, seeing the keys to success employed by America, rushed to emulate us, quickly increasing the educational levels of their own citizens by investing in primary schools, in secondary education, and increasingly in college and university education. But even as it became clearer to the entire world that economic and social prosperity lay in an educated population, some basic flaws in the American model became painfully evident here in the United States. The benefits of education were not spread equitably throughout society. People of color, immigrants, and people in rural areas did not enjoy the same educational access or attainment as did white Americans from cities and suburbs. Last year, 22% of Oregon's white high school graduates went on to the Oregon University system. That's an abysmally low figure in a knowledge economy. But only 19% of those graduating who were African American or American Indian did so. And just 12% of the Hispanic and Latino graduates in last year's high school graduating class in Oregon went on to college at the universities. Half the rate of the whites and the rate of the whites was too low to sustain us as an economy in the future. And as our population ages, and for those of you who haven't yet kept up on this, we will soon have the fourth highest proportion of retirement age people in the country. More and more, the people in Oregon are going to start looking like me. Well, let's hope not. But a stark reality is beginning to dawn on Oregonians and Americans. A very high proportion of younger Americans 
comes from the very groups of people for whom community college and university education has not been an aspiration, an expectation, or a reality. In Oregon, the most at-risk populations for not completing high school and attending college are the only ones whose numbers will be increasing. You want me to say that again? In Oregon, the only populations that will be growing are those who historically have not completed high school and gone on to college at the same rate as the majority population. Oregon's future and the well-being of Oregonians are tied to the very populations that have been most at risk and most marginalized over the sweep of our state's history. In Oregon, this demographic shift, coupled with a 15-year steady disinvestment in education, has resulted in something that is unusual in human history. Sociologists will study us in centuries to come because we will have a younger generation of adults less well-educated than are its elders. In the 1960s, as the competitive advantage of America's educated workforce became apparent to the rest of the world, Oregon was first among equals. Nearly 95% of our young adults had graduated from high school. Our young adults also had attended and completed community colleges and universities at rates that were among the highest in the country and therefore the highest in the world. Today, Oregon is one of only a few states in which those over 35 are more likely to have a college education than those adults 34 years of age and younger. And we must engage and energize our entire state, all of us, to instill in every child and every family and every community the deep-seated belief that they will succeed in high school, that they will succeed in community college, that they can succeed and will succeed in the university. We have to do this together. It's hard work for us and it's hard work for our students. I hope that together we can gain support as we meet with legislators and candidates, support for the initiatives of the governor and the State Board of Higher Education that will get more students of color and more underserved students throughout the state successfully through high school, into college, and through college to degrees. Our mutual challenge is to kindle hope from the embers of our potential to find ways to challenge and overcome the pessimism, the apathy, the racism, and the divisiveness in our communities. That is our responsibility, so that we do not dash the hopes of the next generation of Oregonians. Together, all of us together, must raise the aspiration and have high expectations for our young people. And we need to speak to them of the value and the promise of possibilities that education will provide them. Together, we can ensure that education is a civil right and a civic hope for all Oregonians, and therefore and thereby make more certain that the other civil rights and other civic hopes are enhanced and enshrined for all of us. I thank you so much for allowing me to be with you tonight. I'm honored, I'm privileged, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you in order to foster the dream and the hope of a better Oregon. Thank you very much.